Hello, I'm Simon Kroom. I'm a professor of supply chain management at the University of San Diego in California. And in this second presentation, trying to explore the issues around the supply chain crisis that we're facing on a global scale, I want to look at some of the solutions. You know, post pandemic, if that's where we're heading, are we going back to normal? Are we going back to the future? So let's take a look at what that might mean. You know, I think supply chains are drastically changing, for sure. Um, what used to work no longer will. And I think that's a simple and glib comment, but it's a fundamental challenge because we all revert back to the familiar practices. That's going to be a challenge. I think consumer choice is a flawed marketing concept. I think the problem of giving a wide variety of different products and also different services, but especially products, can cause us problems, and we'll see why shortly. Um, cost isn't always the number one KPI. It isn't always why we get the business. Um, I think there are many other facets we need to take into account. We need to take into account contribution. We need to take into account value added. We need to take into account profit. We need to take into account growth and growth potential. Lean supply chains can become anorexic. There's been a lot of writing about this for decades, in fact, that sometimes when we try to go lean, it leaves us in a position where we cannot satisfy the needs of our marketplace and the needs of our business. Um, we've seen that painfully uh, in the last two years. This is one that's really critically. This variation in capacity utilization and service levels that we see because of variability disrupts supply chains. And it certainly disrupt, disrupts supply chains that are synchronized. So let's think about what's happening with supply chains. You know, I often think of supply chains as economic organisms. You know, a chain is not a good description. It's not one link to another link. There are multiple links connected and interacting with many other links across supply chains, not just within one supply chain. So they're mutating. These organisms, these economic organisms are mutating. We need to know how evolution will change behaviors and the reactions and interactions uh, within a supply chain. So I'm going to talk about the source of these cascading failures in supply chains. What does it look like? Why? And then, you know, what basically are some of the solutions to this? Um, the solution is, is actually recognizing the underlying uh, problem. Supply chains hate variability and they hate disruption. And we've seen what happens at our ports, at our stores, at our factories. Variability, things that change, mess us around. So we talked about bullwhip effect, the traditional bullwhip effect in the first video. In this video, what I want to do is ch show that there are profound differences in what bullwhip might look like. Firstly, we're seeing a lot more volatility across the marketplace. The demand is peaking and troughing. You know, we have a people clamoring for paper products, clamoring for turkeys, clamoring for gifts for the holiday season. Tier one, just complete volatility. Because one, they're trying to respond to the marketplace. And two, they're trying to get supply. And their suppliers are seeing lots of volatility. If this is the port where we're getting imports of that, our products, it's taken a long time to unload the ships. And the factories, tier three, and I'm only going back three tiers here, tier three have seen, you know, from a low point a year and a half ago to a significant uptick in manufacturing in some parts, in some sectors, in some geographies. We've still got shortages of semiconductors for autos. We've still got power outages in factories. We've still got COVID and COVID vaccination requirements leading to labor shortages and something called the mass resignation where we saw 4 million people leave US employment in September. So are we seeing a reverse bullwhip? Is that what's happening? Are we seeing instead of the 
bullwhip starting level at the marketplace, what actually happens is the marketplace is extremely volatile and the rest of the supply chain, because of scarcity, because of lack of supply, is being damped. Or are we seeing a complex failure where, in essence, we've just got this random performance at each tier? You know, at the moment, we can't get products through the ports very easily. We can't get products to the marketplace. Um, inventory is being drawn on and people are clamoring for whatever's available. You know, if we think about retail supply chains, the panic purchasing and panic buying phenomena is not going to go away. And maybe at tier three, we're seeing some spikes, but is that timely enough for this peak in demand? Can we get from tier three to tier uh, one, or sorry, to the marketplace rapidly enough. So how are these supply chains going to mutate? I think there are five key things. Firstly, we're going to see more integrated and agile supply chains involving some rationing. Secondly, it, to me, it underlines why capacity is so important. Three, we're looking at something called post lean supply chains. In other words, supply chains where our obsession is not with taking um, inventory and waste time out of the system as much as we have been. As I've already said, far more coordination of marketing and sales and variety achieved through focused supply chains. We have to probably separate supply chains within supply chains. So why is this? We talked about Little's Law in the previous video. So what Little's Law shows us is this infernal triangle. What do I mean by that? Well, when we have relatively low variety, as in down here, we can do two things. We can have high capacity utilization and we can have short waiting times or low inventories. As we add variety, we can go this way which means you have to wait, but you're still utilizing your assets. That's, you know, an accountant's dream is that we utilize our assets, but a marketing nightmare because we're not serving the customers. Or we can serve the customers, but we've got very low utilization. And by the way, the operations people get beaten up for that. Under what we call ordinary, normal times, this phenomena happens so often that I'd hate to tell you how many consulting uh, assignments I've had where the fundamental problem was the company has gone from this curve, has added more products to their range and wondering why their capacity utilization and their productivity has gone down. We also need to think about capacity. This is the classic model of a pipeline. And as you can see here, the narrow part of the pipeline is where the bottleneck is. And in a hypothetical world, it's usually relatively clear to see where the bottleneck is. I mean, there are very few hypothetical real <laughs> capacity pipelines that look like this. But what we're now seeing is this. We're seeing, for example, warehouse capacity is being constricted, then it's being freed up. We're seeing even more that a past, uh, assembly capacity is extremely volatile because factories have been closed for COVID, for health and safety, for power, and because of supply issues here. And this, these red arrows, the double-headed arrows, are really a measure of some form of variation or standard deviation. So what does this mean? Well, it means this. The bottleneck keeps moving. Where is it? on the supply chain. Depends what day of the week it is, to be frank. So what can we do? We can focus our supply chains. In other words, make sure our supply chains are doing a narrow range of activities. We can isolate capacity along specific markets and product markets, thinking about, you know, maybe contracting for capacity. It's not an unusual practice. Why can we not do it more often, instead of saying to a supplier, I need you su to supply me 200 products and I will pay you for what you deliver, can we not say, I will pay you for inputs? In other words, I will pay you for production time. 
And, you know, whether I call off on that production time or not, you're being paid for it. And, you know, we can negotiate around those terms. We need more transparency upstream. And people do business with people. People do great business with people they like. Relationships are key. Second thing, restrict options. More choice means more waiting, more volatility, and lower capacity utilization. And thirdly, manage that demand. Rationing is an option. So is favoring customers that we like or that have strategic benefit. And be mindful of promotions. Buy one, get one free disrupts nearly every supply chain I've ever seen. It's just a nightmare for an operations and supply chain person. We can also do this. We can take the approach that, um, you know, bare paints have. Your supply chain is basically a vanilla supply chain. And then what we do is we add the flavors once the customer comes in and tells us what flavors. In bare paints example, all of the paint that they produce is one color. Then it's mixed at your Home Depot or your Lowe's. Yeah, we have three options, you know, satin, gloss and matte paint. But that's about it. Think of how phenomenal that um, postponement strategy has been for the profitability of those paint companies. We can do something that I call quasi transparency. This is where we're working on collaborative planning and forecasting with our chain partners. Now, if you've got real time supply chain data, maybe you've got real transparency. But if not, what can you do? Identify your key accounts. Who are the customers we need to satisfy? We can share real time demand signals upstream, even if it's using the old fashion steam powered methods of email and telephone and zoom conferencing or whatever. Um, we need to mediate marketing plans with immediate short term availability. This is what Dell do. If you want to buy a laptop, you may already have a specification in mind, you know what power chip you want, you know what memory you want, you know what graphics card and when you go on the Dell website, and you put those options in, it will offer alternatives and it may well offer you you know for example if you wanted a hundred uh, six hundred gigabyte hard drive it may offer you uh, a terabyte of hard drive for fifteen dollars more um, and the reason they do that is one it doesn't cost them that much to make a much bigger hard drive two they may have more available immediate availability immediate availability of the terabyte so in other words they can get that computer to you quicker and Dell know that if you can get things quickly, you're more likely to buy. We have become an impatient consuming planet. And then we need contingency plans for consumers. What substitutes can we offer? And by the way, do we manage strategic delinquencies, de strategic backlogs? Because not every customer is equal. Not every product is equal. So we might want to keep our key customers happy, but may, we may also know some of our products make a much greater contribution. So let's think about what's happened in the data. And I'm just going to go through this very quickly. You know, we saw a massive drop in labor force participation rate right at the start of the lockdown, March, April 2020. And, you know, this has carried on to some extent. We're, we're getting returned to work, but we've also had what is called the mass resignation. Four million people dropped off the employment roll in uh, September. We've seen this amazing variation. And I'm looking at January to August in each of the last three years, including 2021. 19 to 20, a 13% drop, obviously for COVID. 20 to 21, a 21% increase. That's an extreme variation. It shows that in essence, in 2020, we went on a demand recession. We imported far less. Now we're trying to import far more. But it's slightly up on 2019. From a supply chain point of view, that volatility is massive. From an economic point of view, well, we're back to some form of stability. So you have two different viewpoints of what's happening in the economy. We saw, for example, 
in GDP, a massive plummet in quarter two, and then a massive spike in quarter three. Lockdown frightened everybody. We stopped spending. After we'd had a few months, we started to rebuy and we started to, you know, find ways around the lockdown. You know, restaurants doing delivery meals, eating outdoors, those sorts of things. Um, we also saw at the start of 2021, China's industrial production year on year went up by a third, but it went up by a third on a very low base because January 20 was start of COVID. Mass lockdowns, factories closed, but it's still a big disruption in flow through the supply chain. We've seen port congestion. I don't probably need to tell you much about this. Quarter of a million con containers off the coast of LA. Lots of conversations about diverting to the East Coast. And, you know, the volume of difference between the Port of Philadelphia and the Port of Los Angeles is immense. There's a reason for that. The West Coast is near to Asia. Asia is one of our main markets, not not counting Canada and Mexico, but Asia is one of our big import markets. Port congestion has risen sharply, particularly container ships. Dwell times, how long we're sitting waiting at the port for things to move has increased drastically. Um, and empty containers have become a big problem. 50% of all of the ships leaving the UK and leaving the US contain empty containers. There's nothing in them. It's getting the containers back to the manufacturers. That's the flow of product. Now, the import and export data looks a little bit different to that because of the value of exports. Much higher up the value chain of, is uh, the products that are exported from both the UK and, and from uh, the US. Uh, where are those empty containers? Most of them are doing nothing. What's happening with warehouse capacity in the US? Well, 97.6% is occupied. That's a high occupancy rate. That is problematic, to be honest, because it means we haven't got much slack for variability, to cope with variability. We've got a lot of inventory, but how are we going to move more product flowing through those warehouses? There's high demand for warehouse space, very low supply. Department of Commerce says we need 330 million square foot more of space, really for e-commerce in the next three and a half years. And then it's costing a lot more money to build, not just warehouses, but everything. 9.7% uh, increase in lease rates to reflect that. And then when we look at how Warehouse space, again, think of Little's Law and capacity utilisation. High capacity utilisation means the long delays when we've got high variety. So we're going to see more delays because we've got no warehouse space spare. We've gone from 8.5% in 2016 to 6.4% in 2021. That's a significant squeezing of flexibility. So hopefully this has given you some insights into what I think are going to be the solutions to our supply chain problems. You know, it's not going to be back to normal. We've got to get back to the future of supply chain. Thank you.